Chicago. What do you say? It's the CHGO Cubs podcast, and we are back for another hot week of Cubs baseball. Luke Stuckmeyer, Ryan Herrera, Cody Del Mendo, and our special guest this Monday afternoon at 120, live, the one, the only, conductor of the Big Blue Train, our good friend Dan Plezak from MLB Network. Dan, how you doing, bud? Good, Luke. The Big Blue Train, it's rolling. Hey, <laughs> They really caught my attention the last two weeks and really this past weekend to win two or three in Toronto against the Blue Jays because I'm going to tell you this, that is a really, really good Blue Jays team that can go really deep into the postseason and the Cubs made them work very hard this weekend, but I thought two out of three up in Toronto was a big weekend for the Cubs. Yeah, and I think you had to after, you know, losing to uh, losing a series to the Mets, it's like you had to do something to get that vibe back after beating the Braves. So now, Dan, I look at this next dozen games. They end the, the, the Cubs end the month against another one of your former teams, the Brewers, right? That's the team they're, they're chasing in the division. So we know the Brewers series is going to be big at the end of the month. But in my eyes, if the Cubs don't catch the Brewers, I don't know why I feel this way, but if they don't catch the Brewers by the end of the month, when they play that series, then I don't think they're going to because in this stretch leading up to that Brewers series, They play the White Sox, the Royals, the Tigers, and the Pirates. It's 12 games against dog teams. Those teams are a combined 92 games under 500, while the Brewers have to play the Dodgers, the Rangers, the Padres, and the Twins, who are a combined 45 over 500. To me, the Cubs season is right here before the end of the month. What do you think about that? Couldn't agree with you more, and I agree with you. I I think that the Cubs are a postseason team, but I think you always want to count on, you want to win the division. That's that's the thing you want to do. Listen, at this point going into this season, if you would have told a Cub fan, hey, you were going to be one of the two wildcard teams, hands would have been up all over Riggaville. We'll sign up for it and we'll take it. But with that said, and this is a vulnerable Milwaukee team, right? Now, They're a good team, but they're not nearly as good as they've been the last couple of years. The next 12 days, heavily leaning schedule in favor of the Cubs. And what that can do, if they can cut into this couple game margin and even get greedy and get a game and a half or two games ahead of Milwaukee going into the month of September, that would be huge. I think this, I look at this Cub team, I've been surprised at how well they've played lately. But when you dive into it, Tyone's thrown the ball a lot better. Abad came out of nowhere and had a powerhouse start in Toronto, which was huge for them. But when you look at what good teams need to do, they need to have good players. And Dansby Swanson is starting to get hot and say whatever you want. The Cubs have hit a home run with Cody Bellinger. Every good team in the postseason needs to have that one guy that you can jump on his back and he can carry you. And Cody Bellinger is starting to turn into that guy again. And I was excited to see that the Cubs stand pat. They didn't do anything as far as moving guys. And I thought the acquisition of Candelario was huge. I get it. Wisdom has been a great story, but there's a lot of swing and miss that comes with his game. Candelario puts the ball in play. He can run. He's athletic. So when you look at Candelario, you look at Bellinger, you look at Dansby Swanson, They've got three guys right now that are playing well. You throw Nico Horner into that mix. This is a good team that has surprised a lot of people right now. We're going to find out, Luke, in the next two weeks, is this a real postseason team or not? And if it is, they're going to hit this 12-game schedule and go somewhere around 9-3, 8-4. And if they can do that, they'll be in first place going into the first week of September. I'm curious what you thought, because you're, you're saying, like, I, I think we all believe that this team is a playoff caliber team. When they were going through that, that entire May of just rough play, and there was a couple weeks in June where they had, like, just that whole stretch where they were just consistently underperforming, did that change your mind about the team, or were you always of the belief that this team, if they turned it on like they have, they could make a run? I mean, it, it was hard to say in the middle of May, like, hey, I really like this team. It's a playoff team. At that time, Marcus Stroman, you could make a case, was he's, a, he's the best pitcher in the National League. Now, he has been anything other than that his last handful of starts since he went on the IL. But with that said, Justin Steele has turned into a big-time, legitimate front-of-the-rotation player. 
I think the surprising thing to me is we were all in the industry from the national level looking to see was Cody Bellinger as bad as he's been the last two years or is he going to be able to get back to being the player that he was an NL MVP type of player and so through April into May he was showing you flashes of okay hey maybe this guy maybe this was a great taking the flyer on a guy for one year maybe just maybe you know putting on a Cub uniform, getting out of L.A., change the scenery would do him some good. If anything, he's gotten better as the season has gone on, and he just makes you more and more think about, like, man, this guy is a legitimate player. And if he can continue to play the way he's played the last few weeks, the rest of the way, it's going to be hard for the Cubs not to get in because they're playing in a Division One that is very winnable, and there really isn't anybody – Outside of the Brewers, the Reds were a really good story, but outside of the Brewers, that is their main competition. It's not like they're chasing the Atlanta Braves, right? It's not like they're chasing one of these juggernauts in the NL. They're not chasing the Dodgers. They're in a division that is very winnable, and if they can somehow muster together the next couple of weeks, grab control of this division, and all of a sudden they get some momentum, I think they'd be a hard, time, a hard team to beat in the month of September as far as winning the NL Central. Uh, Dan, the re- one of the reasons the Cubs have gotten to this point, one guy you have not mentioned is Mike Talkman. Um, oh, can you salvation hasn't he? He's been yeah. unre- he's been amazing. I-, I would just like to know your thoughts on him as a player because to me he just continues to surprise me more and more. He was a spring training invite, and he's thrown himself into he's put himself in a position where it feels like when the Cubs don't play him it feels like they're they're not putting out the best lineup so I I, I'm curious what your thoughts on on Talkman not only as the leadoff guy but you know just overall because the defense has been pretty fun to watch too he's been a really good acquisition I will say this I had a chance to watch him being here in the Northeast living in New Jersey you know this is the middle of Yankee Mets country he had some really productive at-bats for the Yankees. The problem is he just got lost in the shuffle of a team that one had a lot of high-priced superstars where he just couldn't get enough bats and stay in a rotation to where he was going to get enough bats during the course of the week to stay sharp and to stay good. Anytime you get a player and you give them a chance to play and you make them feel wanted, he feels wanted wearing that Cub uniform. And I can tell you this. The guys feed off of his energy. They feed off of his enthusiasm. He's played really good defense in the outfield, and he has had the knack for coming up with a big hit. He can hit the ball in the ballpark. He's getting to a point where he's one of those guys you want up with the game on the line. You feel like he's going to put the ball in play with runners in scoring position. If he can continue to play like this, there are so many more positives right now with the Cubs. He's being one of them. Another guy that was off to a miserable start, Jamison Tyone, the first two months of the season, you're going like, wait a minute. Is this the guy we got from the Yankees that signed him as a free agent? What's going on here? He's finally starting to show signs of life. So guys like Talkman and Jamison Tyone, they have really helped bolster this team the last six, seven weeks. And I agree with you. Talkman, when you see his name in the lineup, you feel like, okay, that guy needs to be in that lineup because he's a definitely, he's been a big part of their offense. And Tyone, of course, wasn't good yesterday, but the six or seven starts before that, you were like, oh, here he comes. That is right. the guy from New York. And, and Dan, you said you talk about Talkman being that guy that was maybe not expected to be great. You know, you just thought you were getting sort of a solid, okay player, but he's one of those right. great surprises every good playoff team seems to find, right? You, you mentioned Talkman, and on, on the pitching side, you look at the other guy you mentioned earlier in the show, Javier Assad. Um, the, a reliever that kind of came out of nowhere in spring training in the World Baseball Classic. By the way, you can use this uh, when you talk about them at MLB Network because it's A-S-S-A-D. I like to call him the ass man <laughs> like Kramer used to have the license plate and Seinfeld the ass man. And he, that, since we gave him that nickname and we put out the, the, the license plate, the ass man, yep. he's taken off. So I don't want to take full credit for his season, but he has bounced back since we did that. Do you believe in in teams having to find that type of (coughs) surprise player? I mean, Bellinger, you knew had that potential, but Assad and Talkman, you never thought you were going to get that type of season from them. 
No, but but you know what, Luke? Every good team, and, and you go back over the course of the really good teams that the Cubs have had over the years, there's always that guy that may not be an everyday player. He may be the fourth outfielder. He may be a utility infielder. He may be the backup catcher that ends up playing a key role. And one of the things in baseball today, especially, you have to have, if you're David Ross, the ability to use your entire roster because sooner or later, you're going to have to give guys days off and you're going to go through a lot of different players. And when you have a guy that you can count on and depend on, it just makes it so much more easier as a manager. And and the other guy you have at Steel, right? Like yeah. I know I watch oh. you on I watch you on Twitter, Dan, and each month, beginning of each month, you put out the DP top 25. Starting pitch top 25 is it starting pitchers, correct? Starting pitchers, right? Okay. Now. So I know that in August, start of August, you had Steele up to number three for starting pitchers. That's that's in baseball you're talking about, right? Yeah, he Luke, he's come a long way in a short period of time. And I've always been a fan of his. But you're always a little wondering, like, can a two-pitch pitcher, he's basically a two-pitch guy, can he get away with it? Can he pitch with it? One of the things that I've been ultra impressed with him is the ability to go through a lineup the second time and he's not a guy that's looking like when the bullpen phones ring, is he looking out there, you know, when things get hairy, is he looking out for a friend? Does he want some help in the bullpen? Luke, he has taken it to another level. And I think one of the things you have to look forward to now more than ever in the game of baseball, do you have swing and miss in your game? Can you strike people out? And it's so important right now because so many lineups, guys, it's a lot of all or nothing. Guys are swinging from their heels. They're swinging for the fences. Velocity, 94 to 95, it's industry-wide right now. It's in starting pitching, it's in bullpens. So if you don't throw hard, it makes it a little bit easier. But when you can strike people out like he does, and I think the biggest thing that I've noticed, Luke, when I watch Steele, I'm a big body language guy. I, I want to see a guy on the mound that gets the sign. He's very decisive. Not You can't walk around the mound as much as you can as you could in the past because of the pitch clock, but he gets the ball. There's no BS. He's locked in on the glove and his body language. It's like he's, I have this theory that I tried to live by when I pitched. When you run out to take that mound, whether it's from the bullpen or a game starts, you could do one of two things. You can be the hunter or the hunted. And when you go out with the mentality, when you watch him, that he's going out to hunt hitters, he's not out there like, you know, ease his way through an inning. He's out there, takes his warm-ups, and, man, he is coming at you. He is hunting hitters. He's not allowing them to hunt him. I mean, the concern is he's getting to a part where the innings, he has never gone that many innings. But, Luke, if he's as good as we all think that he is, he's going to pass that test. He's going to be okay the rest of the way. And now's when you need a guy like Jameis Tyon. He had a little bit of a clunker Sunday in Toronto. This is when he's got to put the wheels back on that car and get that car driving down the highway again because every game now, when you start getting into the middle of August, you, you hate to say that games, every game is a must win. But boy, the important factor, and these games become more and more crucial because you can make up for a bad start in April. You get out of the box like the Cubs did or you have a lousy first couple of weeks of May, you could dig yourself a hole, but you've got time to dig out of that hole. When you start getting into the middle part of August and you have a bad two-week stretch, say 15 games, where you go 5-10, and 10, now you put a lot of heat on yourself in the month of September to play 30 games, and you better go somewhere around 20-10 and 10 or 18-12 and 12 to make up for that bad stretch. They can ill afford to have another one of those stretches like they had in May going into June, they can't afford to have another one of those. So they need these guys all to start firing again. And you, we talk about Justin Steele, but that always brings to my mind what like he always talks about one of his best friends, Albert Alzwai, um, who, you know, talking to people with the Cubs and plans, even as, as recently as like a year and a half, two years ago, he was still like thought of as a possible anchor in the rotation. Now he's closing games. He's 16 for 17 on save opportunities. And I, if my math is correct, the only uh, only reliever, only closer with that high of a conversion rate 
with as, as many as 17 save opportunities is Alexis Diaz, who's 33 for 34. So <laughs> Edward Elzelay is like pitching since he's gotten the job, like an elite closer. Uh, I'm just curious what you think, what you've seen uh, out of Edward Elzelay. Again, a guy whose role has changed so much in the last couple seasons uh, and what he's been able to do since he started getting the majority of the opportunities in the ninth inning with the game on the line in a closing uh, opportunity. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the same book that I read and I wrote for myself. I was a starting pitcher in the minor leagues with the Milwaukee Brewers. Made the team my rookie year as the fifth starter. We had a few days off, every Monday off in the month of April. And the then manager, George Bamberger, said to me, hey, we're going to put you in a bullpen. We're just going to ease your way into that. And then, uh, you know, we'll get you back in the rotation first week of May. Disappointed. Okay. But you know what it did and what it's done for Alzali? It's taking a lot of the thinking away, right? When you go through a lineup one time and you have a big arm like he has and like I had, you warm up and you're in the mid-90s, good hard breaking ball. A couple of things you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about establishing a third pitch. You don't have to worry about going through a lineup a second or third time. You don't have to worry about conserving bullets early so you have bullets in the sixth and seventh inning. You don't have to worry about, hey, who's the one guy in the lineup I don't want to pitch to? How am I going to navigate that lineup? Instead, what he does, he warms up. He's going out there for three, maybe four outs. He believes in his fastball now. He believes in his off-speed stuff. So you're getting a guy, one, that has stopped thinking. He's just throwing. He's pitching a lot on adrenaline. That job, I, I did that job for 18 years. You sit all day, and the only way you're going to pitch, the score has to be right, the conditions have to be right, and you see it developing before your eyes in the fifth and sixth inning. You start getting that nervous stomach. You start stretching and moving around. You're like, okay. And these 25 other guys, they're depending on me to come in there in the ninth to get those last three outs. So you see a guy now that he takes his warm-ups coming in in the ninth inning. He's breathing fire. His chest is out. His neck is bowed. He doesn't have to do a lot other than throw his best stuff. And that's what he's doing now. And I, you know what I love about him? Uh, he's very animated after he gets a save. Uh, he... He keeps his motions in and check until he gets that 27th out. But he certainly looks like a guy that enjoys the moment being out there with the game on the line. He enjoys the moment sitting there for two and a half hours wondering if he's going to get in. It's not like he runs out there and he's a little timid and shy. He's kind of approaching the ninth inning the way Justin Steele approaches the first inning. They're going out there hunting instead of being the hunted. And he's been a salvation for that back end of the bullpen. That bullpen has been unsung all season long. Another guy that doesn't get a lot of credit, Mark Leiter, has been some really good baseball for that bullpen. They've had a lot of different contributions. But listen, they've, they have found a guy in Alzheimer's. The only thing he'll do to, at times, he may beat himself, and he'll do that because he gets a little erratic, a little wild. But that's what comes with being a power type of pitcher. He's been a revelation to that bullpen. And if he continues to pitch well, you're going to see him continue to get more confident and more confident. And the more he does it and the more he's successful doing it, the better he's going to be at it. I animated as he was after a save. Did you ever get that kind of fire like he got after, oh, after every absolutely. save? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I'm going to tell you, and, and when you come in on a game on the road, man, when you're pitching on the road in its hostile environment and you're warming up and people are standing over there, they're screaming at you, you know, hey, you stink. You're going to give it up, and you come in. And, you know, you you come in, and when that manager hands you, run in from that bullpen, the manager hands you the ball. Man, the ma music's blaring on the road. They're getting everybody on their feet. And you you feel that energy. And you could do one of two things. You could channel that energy and say, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shut up every one of these 45,000. I'm getting three outs here. And, man, when you do it, you got to be a real special breed. you got to be like Mariano Rivera to just, like, Get in, come in, one, two, three, you get a last out, you punch a guy out, the game's over, and you just kind of like, ooh, that was easy. I mean, most guys, that's how I was. You get that last out, man, it's just like, yeah! Like, you know, you did something <laughs> really good, and, and I like it. I, I like it because he doesn't show hitters up. He doesn't strike anybody out and point at him and, like, gets the first out of the night. He waits to get that last out, and when he gets that last out, he's directing that energy to himself or the Cub dugout or his starting catcher. He's not directing and pointing fingers at anybody on the other team. I love what he does. 
Man, if you want to get Dan Plezak fired up, you ask him about pitching, bratwurst, oh. or Italian sausage. Those three <laughs> man, things. Man, you got that right, Luke. <laughs> I, so, Dan, it worked for you, obviously, young, it, very early in your career. You didn't like that decision, as you mentioned, but you, you went to the bullpen. 18 years later, you had this great career as a reliever. Maybe it's going to work that way for Al's life. We hope so. How about on the flip side? Now you see... Uh, Drew Smiley, a guy who was a starter most of the season, he's done some bullpen before in his career. How difficult is it midseason to make the flip the other way? Like being the starter, now you're going to the bullpen again, and you're an older guy, you're a veteran, and he, he had a great first half of the season, but you could just see it falling apart. The wheels were completely coming off for him. Can he recapture some of that success possibly in the bullpen? Because Lighter's been great, but they just don't have another lefty that's been able to help them. Yes and no. This is my concern. When you've pitched as long as he has pitched and you have a defined role, and I think at times you convince yourself or your body that you throw on Monday, you do some running and long toss on Tuesday, you take the easy day on Wednesday, you throw a bullpen on Friday, and you get ready to throw a couple of days later. The bullpen is kind of one of those fire drills, man, where it's haywire. In a perfect world as a manager, um, you'd like to be able to tell a guy like Smiley, he's going to be your option, like close game, third, fourth inning, multiple inning guy. I don't know if they're going to use him like as a situational lefty guy, bring him in in seventh. Maybe they will if the lineup is right where you've got a big time lefty and you've got some righties that are behind you. You feel good that Smiley can get him out with with that curveball. I think the biggest adjustment for him is going to be, it's like, listen, when, you, when you've had some success like he has, let's call it what it is. It's a demotion to the bullpen for him. Um, and you have to hope that he accepts what the, what's going to be given to him. And listen, uh, he kind of made his bed, and this, this is the best way the Cubs can use him right now. They have better options in that starting rotation. I'm fully – fully believing that he's going to go down there to the bullpen and he wants to be a good bullpen pitcher. And if that's the case, Luke, don't be surprised in the next couple of weeks. He may not get a win out of the bullpen and he may not get a save, but there may be a couple of games where the starter's in trouble, the Cubs are down 3-1 to one going into the third inning. They bring him in out of the bullpen. He can go the fourth, fifth, and sixth inning, allow the Cubs to get back into a game and win a game. He may not get a lot of credit in the newspapers and on podcasts and on cable and on marquee network, but inside that clubhouse of the 26 players and the coaches, they all know that they're going to win. They won that game because Drew Smiley kept that game in check to give them a chance to score a couple runs, to take the lead and let the rest of the bullpen take over. So it, it's, it's not as glamorous as a role, right? When you're a starting pitcher, you go five and two thirds, you give up one run, you win eight to one. Everybody wants to talk to you. Hey, great game. You got into the sixth inning. Not a lot of cameras in your face. Not a lot of microphones in your face. When you pitch the third, fourth, and fifth inning, or the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and you come back and win the seventh and the eighth. But it's a very important role inside the walls of that clubhouse. And I think he'll accept what he's going to do. And if he does, he'll help them win some games out of the bullpen. Uh, speaking of this starting rotation, uh, a lot of people in the chat are asking about Marcus Stroman. Uh, before he went on the injured list, he really struggled. So, honestly, since the Cubs went to London, um, what's your take on him right now? Uh, you know, is I know it's the Cubs are calling it a hip injury. I listen he's back Wednesday. Yeah, he's supposed to be back Wednesday, and uh, you know the Cubs say that that that's a that's a thing. I don't know if they just wanted to give him a break to clear his mind mentally. I don't know, but what how what do you think he needs to do, or what he what you've from what you've seen, what what needs what does he need to do to get back on track? Well, when when you know he's throwing the ball really well, he induces a lot of ground balls. And in April and May, and I know you go back and say, well, it's cold and it's great weather to pitch in and Wrigley in April, May, and that's a fact. That's a truth. That ballpark can be the best ballpark to pitch in. The grass is high, the grass is thick, the wind blows in. Not a better ballpark in the planet. You start getting into the middle of May, June, all of a sudden that wind shifts. Flags start blowing out. You're not sinking the ball. You're getting the ball up in the strike zone. He's never been a guy that's been 98 to 100. He's a really good pitcher and not a thrower. And I think uh, whether it's the hip, whatever it is, 
It's hard for it not to snowball. I don't care how long you played. You get in one of those bad ruts. One start, you're like, okay, shake it off. When it happens a second time, you're like, okay, a little bit of caution. When it happens the third time, you're like, okay, I got to start making some changes. What am I doing? Am I tipping my pitches? Are my mechanically sound? What's wrong with the sinker? Why isn't it moving? The curveball, it's not as, it's bigger. It doesn't have the depth and the bite. What do I have to do? So hopefully he's been able to take some time and go back into that work lab and figure out what it is. Is it the tilt? Is it the movement? Is it velocity? Is it arm side? Is it glove side? Every pitcher has one side they throw the part of the plate better than others, with the exception of Greg Maddox, who could throw it anywhere. But most guys are either good thrown to their glove side or they're good thrown to their arm side. And maybe, just maybe, what, what he was lacking was that one pitch that he had that like, okay, when I get in trouble, I can throw this two-seam sinker down and away to a lefty, down and in to a righty, and get a ground ball. Maybe he lost the feel of that, and he'll find it again. I know this. He was a really good pitcher. And up until the London start, you could have made a case he was the leading, leading guy for the NL Cy Young. He was throwing the ball that well. There's no way that Marcus Stroman forgot how to be that guy in a month and a half or five starts. Just got to get the wheels put back on, and I think you're going to see him when he comes back, he's never been a guy that's lacked a lot of confidence. I think you'll see a better version of Marcus Stroman. Are you going to see the one, the version that was from opening day to the end of May? I don't know. That's kind of hard to do because, quite honestly, he was one of the best pitchers in the National League. If he gets back to that form, then you'd have to think the Cubs are slam dunk to be a postseason team. How difficult is that balance? We talked to him. Uh, with the, the day he got put on the IL and he had said that the previous start, he had been feeling it for a while on the hip and that, you know, as a competitor, he wanted to be out there pitching and was making uh, maybe m m slight mechanical tweaks to kind of like counteract the, like try, he was trying to pitch around it, right? Trying to p pitch around the injury that was bugging him. Um, and obviously it didn't work if you look at the numbers and look at the results. So how, how difficult is that balance as a, you know, a major league, pitcher a competitor wanting to be out there and doing your best for the team but also knowing like there's an injury that's bugging you and it may be time to to address it when the results aren't showing well what, what makes it more difficult is uh when you know like stroman does that he's a very important part of that rotation because think about it before they were going to london Jamison tyon couldn't get out of his own way for a while right so the rest of that rotation justin Steele spent some time on the il you know, there was a heavy workload that, that he was the guy. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this from uh, doing this for a living for a long time. There isn't a pitcher that's alive that goes out there and thinks like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not feeling good. I'm going to go out there and get my brains kicked in. And I'm sure there have been a lot of starts in Marcus Stroman's career where back, neck, ankle, hamstring, whatever, tightness, bicep, whatever it is, shoulder, elbow – that you're not feeling 100%, you take your warm-ups, you're like, okay, let's see what I got today. And the next thing you know, you're into the seventh or the eighth inning. And then what you do, you convince, convince yourself that, hey, you know what? I don't have to be 100%. I can win at 85%. Somehow, some way, I'm going to figure a way out. And kind of the last three or four years of my career, that's what I did. There were a lot of games I warmed up, and I'm like, man, there's nothing coming out of there, but I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll figure it out when I get out there. And you figure it out. And I think with, with Stroman... I'm, I, my guess would be there was a lot of that in there with him that he was like, okay, I'm not at 100%, but I'm still better than a lot of guys at 85 or 90%. But I think when it starts to take away, when you have a nagging injury, and the first thing that goes when you're a pitcher, when you have a kind of a nagging injury, is the accuracy. It's not necessarily you can look at a gun, you're watching a game at home going, man, he's still throwing 92. You know, it, it is, his best bullets were 93, so... His velocity is still good, but that 92 may be a lot more effort. It might be a lot more stress. He has to throw harder to throw that 92. That hit might be bothering him. So, you know, you're trying to get a little extra torque at the end of your delivery, and you're trying to make up because you know you don't feel that good, but then, boy, you're just going to try to make your arm speed a little bit quicker. Then what happens? You get out of whack. You get out of sync. Your timing gets off. You lose the feel of the heater. You lose the feel of the breaking ball. You start pulling pitches into the ground. The first thing that goes, and it's a telltale sign, when something's bothering a pitcher, control is the first thing that goes away, and it's always been that way. But you know what? You do have to look at it this way. I would say 99.9% .9 of the pitchers at this time of the year, 
if they've been on the active roster since opening day, there's something nagging going on. Lower back, hamstring, neck, forearm, elbow. There's something going on that you're addressing between starts. Hopefully he was able to like clean this thing up physically. And if he does and comes back and pitches remotely close to what he was the first two months, you'd have to feel really good about the Cubs' chances right now because of Bellinger's raking right now. Candelario's been a great acquisition. This is a team right now that should have a lot of confidence. And with this schedule coming up, the next two weeks, the 12 games that they're playing, if they should be able to go at least eight and four, nine and three in 12 games. And if that's the case, they're going to be feeling pretty good going into September. I got one more question. We're talking to MLB Network's Dan Plezak, 18 years in the big leagues, former Cub as well. Uh, did a lot of pre and post uh, for NBC Sports Chicago back in the day. Uh, for, by the way, first, Dan, I know that Dan went through all of that stuff because he used to show me, hey, this is how far my right arm will bend now, and this is how far my left arm will bend. And it's like one is 90 degrees and the other one's like 30 degrees. So it, I know you've been through it. It's no joke, Luke. This is my right arm, and there's my throwing arm. It just doesn't bend. You got a good look at it right there. That's it. This is the old throwing arm. It the screen's bend. too small. That, this, the screen's too this small. This is the Close throwing one. Head. That's as far, oh, okay. that's as, far <laughs> as it goes. <laughs> that's unbelievable. So I have one last question for you. Uh, Dansby Swanson's been this great leader, and the Cubs seem to be, you know, he, he was one of the guys that went to Jed Hoyer and was like, don't sell. We need to learn how to win. You, you got to show the franchise how to win baseball games. But it seems like they're all having fun, even through the tough times of the season where they were really struggling. So, Dan, in all your time in baseball, what kind of value or credit do you give to a group of guys in a clubhouse that gets along, seems to be all going in the same direction? We've seen it not work on the south side. They, they've got problems with that. But is there a value to a team that gets along, or is it simply you got to play good baseball, you got to have the talent, and if the guy next to you is a jerk, so be it? Luke? I'm with you on this, man. I did it for 18 years. I'm not that far removed. I'm not that far of a dinosaur. <laughs> you can walk into a clubhouse and you get a sense of what the team's like. And when I watch this Cub team play and you watch the interaction in the dugout, there's not a lot of complaining. There's not a lot of back throwing. There's not a lot of banter back and forth between the manager, the coaches, and the players. It is so important, particularly when you get to this point of the year now, because everybody's getting a little tired. But when you've got guys like Bellinger that have been through this and they've won and they've been on a World Series team, you've got a guy like Dansby Swanson that's been there and he's won. You've got some veteran players that are not just good players, but they're good guys. And we get on this raging debate at MLB Network. There's a show Brian Kenny does. He's called MLB Now, the show for the thinking fan, right? Where you don't take into any account the human interaction. I want to look at a spreadsheet and I want to see player A, player B and player C. I want player B because these stats line up. There's something to be said about the human element. And anybody that tells you that has never played or never been inside a clubhouse. All of the good teams that I've been on, Luke, there, there is a way that you stick together. There's a way that if you have a bad start as a starting pitcher, a couple of position players, a couple of the relievers come in, they they pat you on the back and say, hey, man, you've been carrying us for two weeks. Forget about this one. Let's go. We're going to pick you up next time. And it's a real thing. And I think the one thing that they've done, Jed Hoyer and David Ross, they put together a roster. And listen, you got to take a chance. You hope that Bellinger, you hope you're going to get the guy you're hoping you're going to get. But you don't know if you are. You're going to get a guy in Dansby Swanson, who is one of the keys, the backbones to that Braves team. Plays every day. And when you get those two kind of guys to come into a new team and like where they're at, accept where they're at, not a lot of complaining where they hit the order, not a lot of complaining when they play, where they play. It just, it's, it, it speaks volumes. What you have to have, Luke, you have to have your best players. They have to buy into the plan. They have to buy in and if not fake it like hell that they're rooting for every other guy on the team, because I've been on some really good teams with some superstar players that are selfish, and you can see right through those kind of guys. Dansby Swanson and Bellinger, I think with Bellinger's case, he's reestablishing his credibility. He's getting his confidence back. And I talk a lot with Cliff Floyd, who does a lot of pre and post game shows. 
And he just tells me, man, they just love him there. He loves being there. And the same thing with Dansby Swanson. And so when I'm watching a Cub game, I I'm not necessarily watching the game. I'm watching, hey, when the inning's over and Bellinger's running in from the outfield or he makes the third out and he pops up, you know, his body language, he takes his gloves off and he hands them to the first base coach instead of ripping him off and throwing him on the ground and making the coach go have to pick up that helmet that he threw 20 feet down the re down the foul line. That, that stuff all adds up over the course of time. But when you do this, you start getting into August, and guys are tired. And they're going to tell you they're not, but, man, it, it is. When you're on a crappy team, the dog days of August, they're a real thing. I'm telling you they're real because I've lived with it. And the cool part about where the Cubs are at right now, I watched that last homestand. There aren't very many empty seats at the corner of Clark and Addison right now. And they don't care if they win the division if they're 82 and 80. And the Cub fans don't care if they're the second wild card team. They want to get into the dance. They're not doing the noise like the Red Sox and the Yankees. Ah, well, we're going to get in, but we're not any good. The hell with it. Cub fans are like, get us in the dance, and we'll see how far we can dance. And that's the beautiful part of it. Uh, he's talking about the human element and no greater human than that guy right there. That's the man you want as a teammate. You want like 15 Dan Plezaks <laughs> on your team and you got yourself a team. We go way back, but if I pick up the phone and say, Dan, can you come on the podcast? Th there's never a question. So I'll never forget that you always remember uh, the people that you started with. And I appreciate it, Dan. Uh, the great Dan Plezak, MLB Network. Dan, uh, thanks. Oh, I, sh I should just say the conductor of the Big Blue Train. I, I shouldn't even see Dan please. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's my guy right there. Dan, thanks again for coming on. We appreciate it. Let's do it again before the playoffs because we're all expecting playoffs. Anytime you want to do this, give me a couple days' notice of my day's free. Let's do it. I'm all I'm all things Big Blue Train. I'm all things you guys do. Whatever you need, I'm, I'm your guy. You are the greatest. Thanks, Dan. We'll see you soon, bud. Thanks, Dan. You got Thanks, it. Dan. woo -hoo! <laughs> you got to be a little crazy to be a reliever too and that's my guy he's a little bit crazy uh hey DraftKings ufc number 292 coming up a bantam weight battle for the belt is going down during ufc 292 aljamain sterling against sean o'malley they're going to fight for the title this saturday will the current champ keep his crown or is it the challenger's time to shine get your bets on DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Uh, new customers can bet just $5 to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the code CHGO. New customers can bet just 5 bucks on UFC 292 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's this Saturday, only on DraftKings Sportsbook. Use the code CHGO. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER in New York. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. That's 467-369. In West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net in partnership with Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races, all games regulated by West Virginia Lottery. Uh, please play responsibly. In Connecticut, help is available for a problem with gambling. Call 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 or older in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdic jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after insurance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash MMA terms. Let me tell you guys about Game Time. Please do. Game Time is, we love Game Time here. Game Time is great. Cody, I know you use Game Time a lot when you, those last minute Cubs tickets right at Wrigley Field. Yep. Game Time is great for that. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. I actually use Game Time on Saturday the concert at the uh, the amphitheater in Tinley Park. And my friends, it was Eric Church, my friends, nice. were, they had told me ahead of time, but they like when they bought them, it was like 50 plus dollars, wherever, wherever they had gotten them. And they were sending me the, the screenshots of it, whatever. I'm like, oh, that's, it's kind of expensive. They asked me again on Saturday, they're like, do you want to go? I checked game time, $12. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to the Eric Church concert. So I used game time, Casey 12 bucks. Too. It was great. It was a great concert, first of all, but it was even better because I barely spent any money because game time is so awesome. Uh, How much you know, was it again? 
Twelve dollars. That's unbelievable. To sit on the lawn, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sit on the lawn, but like twelve yeah, it's, bucks it's to see live lawn. music. That's yeah. like uh, you can play that cover to get into a bar. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, but you know, I like Eric, the Eric Church plays for like four hours too. Yeah, you got it was a hell of a show for twelve bucks. It, it was uh, three bucks an hour. Uh, yeah, I don't do that. It was great. Um, so yeah, it's game time. Love game time. I love game time for getting me to the Eric Church concert on Saturday for cheap. Game time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. <laughs> Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time Guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CHGO for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CHGO for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I can I can I can say that with confidence. Guaranteed. A lot last of people, minute tickets, lowest price. A lot of people probably use that for uh, Bruce Springsteen the last few days too. Game or Time. Pink. At least I hope they did. Hope they did. Uh, Dan Plezak, always a great segment. Always enjoy having him on. He's one of the best. Make sure you check Excuse him out on Twitter, Plezak19. Uh, Fernando in the live chat on YouTube says, you know, we got MLB Network guy on the show. Cody could have worn pants. So <laughs> no, no matter what the topic is, it always comes back to whether or not Cody's wearing pants or shorts. And today he's wearing shorts. I thought uh, about putting jeans on today considering the rain. rain and, and a little chillier, too. Like I walked right, in and my pants were soaked. So ah. nice of them to dry up before the show. That's, there is nothing worse than, I will say, wet jeans is a tough wear. They're, they're a tough wear, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You get it's like wet jeans, socks. Oh, it's, uh, wet socks are bad, too. Yeah. Uh, um, Barb also wants to know, did you guys go see Pink this weekend? I no, did not. No. But it does seem like everybody seems like a on concert. social media either went to see Pink or Bruce Springsteen. Or Eric Church. Or Eric Church. <laughs> One of the three. <laughs> I saw none of the three. But. I think Luke would be fun at a Pink concert. That's just yeah. I, I saw a video. Of her, I, I can't like think her, of her like, songs, but I definitely know I know Pink songs. There's a part of the... I, I saw someone I know put on their Instagram story. She was literally like... Flying. Flying yeah. at beautiful historic Wrigley Field. Just like... Yeah, I, don't know, I was like, "What is this?" Yeah, they didn't ri- they didn't risk doing that with Bruce Springsteen, yeah. flying him in the yeah. air. Pink yeah. can do it. Bruce Springsteen, you don't want to have him. You don't want any grabbers while he's in the air. You know. So, um, listen, Dan talked about that vibe of a good team, and you don't want bad guys. That's why I think games like yesterday, while frustrating to the fan base that they weren't able to sweep, I saw the quote from Kyle Hendricks: "Flush it." Flush that Sunday game. Forget about it and move on. Same thing can be said for the Mets series. While it's tough for us to watch it and say, man, that's a missed opportunity. They know it. But when guys aren't bickering back and forth in the clubhouse or slapping each other in the face, they can regroup faster. And I think an off day also helps after that type of loss on Sunday. What did you make of this series against the Jays and how much value do you put into a series against what is a playoff team in Toronto? Well, for me, I mean, on our last show, we I think we all sat here and we we're kind of like they need to take two or three against mm-hmm. Toronto mm-hmm. now, which is a big ask, right? Which was a big ask, and so like, if you take me go back to what I said then, then yeah, I'm I'm content, but I also felt like I just I just felt like with the off day today, they could have put out a better lineup for yesterday. That said, Jamison Tyone did have a bad start. He gave up eight earned runs. Yeah. They didn't want to give Patrick Wisdom an error for a play that I think Cody Bellinger would have made, but whatever. Um, he also had another play at first base that didn't affect the score, but again, another bad defensive play uh, when I think it was Swanson or, or no, it was Horner try, made a throw to first and he yeah. couldn't stretch far enough to get the ball. I, listen, I all I'm saying is that when you have a chance to win a series or sweep, I just don't think going to, I guess, your B lineup is, is the way to go. And again, Ryan, before you say it, yeah. I understand that we don't know what's going on in the locker yeah, room. I no. understand that maybe some guys need some rest. But at the same time, you have an off day today. Yeah, That's my thing. The way, and, the, way I look at it, the way I look at it is like, yeah, I mean, was the wisdom thing probably matchup based for sure? I think that was that's something that both Ross and Jed have talked at points about, like wisdom 
will play more first base against lefties in, in a way. Yeah. Uh, but we also, like you just said, like we don't know what's happening. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying this happened or anything. Like Talkman, what if he woke up yesterday with like a stiff neck, right? And mm. and he needed the day, and and um, you know, you get Sunday and an off day on Monday, so you give him two days off. We don't know that, and we yeah. don't. And Ross won't tell us that because why? Are, what, what is the use of? Tell, openly telling your opponents they don't have to plan for Mike Talkman. Right. What's the point of that, right? So right. we won't know that, and and that obviously hurts Ross because people will be like, well, why aren't you putting your best lineup out there? Um, but he's also wearing it for his players so that they don't have to they don't have to talk about it. They can get their off days, whatever. I, again, I'm not saying that's what happened with Mike Talkman. I know the wisdom thing probably was based on the matchup and getting him in there, but it's just when we're constant when, when when people are yelling about the lineup every single day, and just it's like. These guys, guy, well, guys just aren't built to play 162 anymore. Like we know that, and unless your name's Dansby, sure, or you, Nico, I guess. you try, right? <laughs> but like guys aren't, guys don't play 162 anymore. Guys, like stuff pops up. You know, you just you, you never really know, and they're never gonna tell us. And guys aren't robots that can just they they leave, come back the next day, play baseball, go home. Like it's, they're not robots. They're gonna need that day. And, again, not saying that's what happened yesterday because I do believe the wisdom thing was more based on the matchup itself. But it's that I think I'm, I say it more as a general thing because mm-hmm. people are screaming about lineups every single day. And it's like you guys just no, – no, they won't tell us what's, you know, why guys are down or why, you know, for the most part, try to keep that in the clubhouse. So we don't really ever know. My, no, my, I don't blame guys for needing a day off because – I mean, I can't even do 162 podcasts during a season, let alone play 162 games. None of us are. But, you, you know, I do know this, that managers also like this move, which is they do have the off day. I know what you're saying, Cody. Like, hey, man, they're going to get a rest on Monday, and they're going to get a rest on Thursday. Like, their stays off. But in a long season, they also like to combine that sometimes. So you get the day off before, and now you've got two in a row. And two in a row can really rejuvenate a body or a nagging injury. Mm-hmm. That's it's just it's double the time to try and recoup your body or regroup mentally and so while we saw those guys rest yesterday don't be surprised if that second game against the White Sox you also see somebody else out of the lineup that day because the next day's off right Thursday is going to be off so again he's got an opportunity to rest another player or players two days the guy I worry about is still steel that Dan, Dan says he's gonna, he's, this is his big challenge. Can he get through it the rest mm-hmm. of the season? I tell you, the one thing I feel better about is having watched Assad in that series make that start. That was, I mean, when we say the ass man shoved, the ass man shoved. He shoved. And so <laughs> you see him pitch like that. If you can get him to take a, a, a spot start when Stroman comes back, if he can help give Steele one week off, or one start off, or if somebody else can fill in. That's one of the things that's lacked on this team, right? Yeah. We haven't had Sampson be available. You, you haven't had Killian be able – Killian just doesn't look like the guy. Like You haven't had that guy come up and give the Cubs an option of, all right, we can rest our horse in the rotation yeah. who hasn't ever thrown this. Maybe Assad can be a bigger piece to that puzzle yeah. the rest of the season. Just – to go back on what you're saying, and I agree about Assad. My my thing, is, I I'm only bothered by it because we're in mid August, man. This isn't May. This isn't June. It's not April. Like every game matters. So yes, sure, maybe they're trying to take advantage of being able to give guys two days off, whatever. And I do mainly think that it was matchup based about wisdom. I don't even care that Madrigal was in there. Candelario hasn't been very good. From the right, he hasn't been nearly as good from the right side of the plate as he has from the left side of the plate. So I didn't even care that Madrigal was in the lineup yesterday. I just, it's you're right there in this race, and the Brewers won. Now you're three and a half back, and like I get it, it's only three and a half back. But I, it's when do we get to a point where it's like buckle, buckle up, fasten the seatbelt, says Pat Hughes. Says like that. That's I'm telling you. If we get to the end of the year and they don't make the playoffs, we are going to look back at all the games they blew in May because of the bullpen, and we are going to look at some of these games where they had a chance to win a series like they did on Wednesday, but they threw out the lineup they did then, and they threw out the lineup yesterday. They had a chance to sweep the Blue Jays. Again, I'm not saying that the lineup was the reason they lost, but 
to me, you have to put the best nine out there when you have a chance to win a series or sweep. That's just how I feel. But, about but again, it. is this what I'm saying is that we don't we don't know for sure that the best nine were even available yesterday like that, that right. they, they didn't that's come true. in that's true someone tweaked something and 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 Ross said we're gonna give you the day maybe an emergency situation you put you in there we want to get you two days so that you, you come in with something nagging you get two days of rest as Luke said that can help mm. really help rejuvenate a body versus like we play you now and and, and you risk like I go back to the Dansby Swanson thing right uh, with, with with Mallory um, when she had to get her surgery and then like had he had Ross sat Dansby and put him out of the lineup that day, I'm sure people would have been screaming, why is Dansby Swanson not in the lineup? Why is he not in the lineup? And then he has to leave the game halfway through anyway because his body's shutting down on him. Like that is a very real thing. Again, guys aren't robots. It is very real that guys are dealing with stuff, especially in mid August. Like as please said, like everyone's dealing with something right now. Ross has said it before too. And if a guy needs a day, it may just be he needs the day, especially with an off day the next day. And, again, I'll go back to the wisdom thing. I do believe that was more matchup-based. But this is why I kind of say it in, a, in, in general because this is why the, the screaming about the lineups every day just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because you don't know what's happening with guys in the clubhouse. You don't know what guys are dealing with. We will never know because they're not going to tell us. They don't want to give, their, you don't wanna give uh, opponents any advantage. So even if a guy's out of the lineup, they'll say, oh, yeah, he, but he's available off the bench. Right. Can like, you agree, though, that the Bellinger batting fourth thing is silly? Like he should I, I think yeah, he should be third or higher. higher. I want, probably. Th- yes. He should not be batting fourth. Like, he's missed so many at-bats in late-inning situations because he's batting fourth. That's the only lineup thing uh, that I'll argue Unless about. for some reason he has gone to Ross and said, I'm not that comfortable. I prefer, I prefer him at two or three Fair. because I yeah. want to see him get more at-bats every game. Yes. Like, not, not, it has nothing to do with, uh, who's batting ahead of him, who's batting after him. If somebody's going to get five at-bats in a game, I want Bellinger to be that guy. Um, Ira in the live YouTube chat says, doesn't Javier Assad take the spot of Smiley and doesn't help with Steele getting the rest? I hear what you're saying, Ira. Yeah, I'm saying when Stroman comes back, it allows you to then use that off day to take somebody yeah. out of the rotation, skip them for one start, and then Assad can con- continue to take that start. Right yeah. now, they've essentially got two guys out because they're still having to use steel all the time, and yeah. they have to fill the uh, Stroman spot. A super chat from Michael saying, lineup has been better since the deadline with the exception of Hap. He's not a three-hitter on this team, period, until that's changed. People will complain. Amen. I was saying that for the last three months. Man. Yeah, Cody's I'm, been on that. I've been on that all year. Credit to me. That's no disrespect to Hap. I no, just, it, Bellinger should be batting higher. I mean, he's there's he should be batting. I've said that Hap should be third. hitting. If you're going to keep him up in the top of the lineup, he should be hitting second uh, or first on days that you don't want to play Mike Talkman for whatever dumb reason. And whenever and if not, then he should be in the five or six hole. Just because I I feel like he'd be he'd benefit being behind Bellinger or Swanson, but you know. Again, I hear what you're saying, Ryan. I think halves on base actually lends better to being higher in the lineup, like not third. Like we talked about it last year, like third well, yeah, is I, your I, run I, producing I yeah, spot yeah. is one of them. Like three and four are probably your main should be your main run producers. Like half, yeah. I don't know how he would do. I mean, I, I I think he would be an okay leadoff hitter. I know we really we really like Talkman in that role. He's been pretty good in that role. But like Ian Haps, penchant for for working long counts for taking his walks as again yeah. really really high on base i'm like i wonder what that would look like lead off or even second like maybe, maybe not second maybe lead off would be just better off in that sense um i wonder how that would look but i i mean i'm with you guys at three as a as a idea that your three hitter is a more of a run producer like ian hap he's not your biggest run producer because that's just the way he his, his plate discipline his plate approach is more He's not sitting up there swinging at a lot of things to try to drive in a lot of guys. Like he'll take his walk with guys on base, which sometimes in that role is not exactly what you want. And I know it's not perfect because Bellinger's a lefty, and you could have too many lefties at the top of the lineup. You, it's a lot of managers like to go lefty, righty, lefty, righty, lefty, lefty whatever, back and forth. Um, so I understand it's not a perfect solution. I just think in the grand scheme of things, Joe Madden had something right, and that <laughs> was your best player – you want him near the very top of the lineup, whether it's second or third. You want him batting in the first inning, guaranteed, so that potentially he's someone that gets the um, fifth at bat. I'll tell you what else you want to do, Cody. You want to drop by Sunnyside as you head over to our CHGO Cubs takeover coming up 
because Sunnyside is right by Obvious Shirts, right by Wrigley Field, and right by we're going to be uh, for the takeover. Yeah, I mean, when you see Ian Hat batting third in the lineup, the only way it's going to make yourself <laughs> feel better is stop by Sunnyside on, on, before you head over to the takeover. Sunnyside <laughs> is your home for a judgment-free cannabis shopping, a, a place where all kinds of visitors are welcome to explore, discover, and purchase a wide array of high-quality products. Sunnyside has everything you need to elevate your summer one-stop shop for your all for all your cannabis needs, no matter where you are on your cannabis journey, easy online ordering and in-store pickup, great transparent loyalty program called Sunnyside Rewards. Uh, Sunnyside's House of Brands. Um, we've we've talked about Mindy's before, uh, Good News, High Supply, Cresco, uh, and a whole lot more. Through August, head to Sunnyside.shop and use code CHGO25 at checkout for 25% off your total. Order one use per customer, not stackable with other promotions. That's not only for new customers. Anyone can use our code. Pick up everything you need to elevate your summer. Must be 21 plus or an Illinois Med card holder. You know, uh, guys, I, I talk about Lewis University a lot, but they are students just like us. Full-time jobs, some of us with families, full-time sports fans. You can go back to school to earn a respected degree at Lewis University. That's just 35 miles southwest of Chicago in Romeoville, and it is a hidden gem in our area, ranked as one of U.S. News and World Report's top-tier colleges. The faculty bring real-world experience and instruction to the classroom. It's immediately relevant to your career. They offer career support and academic resources for adult students. If you're out looking to complete your bachelor's degree or your master's degree or maybe enroll in a professional certificate program, Lewis has the right program for you. They offer several career-focused programs that will set you up for success. For instance, They've got one in cybersecurity, and Lewis is a Department of Homeland Security Center of Academic Excellence in cybersecurity, providing students with scholarship funding not available elsewhere. Discover how a degree from Lewis can help you find a better world. Learn more at lewisu.edu slash you can do this. That's lewisu.edu slash you can do this. You can do this. We're hoping the Cubs can do this. Uh, Mad Mike with a super chat saying, I hope the Cubs can call up both PCA and Mervis soon. Send down players to make it happen. Uh, <laughs> people are really getting on the PCA train because he's, he's look, dominating AAA. He's, he's, he's looking wild. real good at AAA. Which is no surprise to me. It really isn't. Yeah. It's no surprise. I, I mean, the closer we, the, the more the pennant race heats up yeah. and the more each game matters, the more we're going to hear the cries for PCA. Yeah. That's just a fact. I did a Twitter space after Saturday's game. Um, I think Tanya's in the chat, too, and she, she asked me about my thoughts on PCA, like getting the call. And I think if he does, I, I genuinely think that he'd be more of like just a bench guy, like, you know, defensive replacement guy or, you know, come and steal a base for you. I, I don't think that the Cubs will find a way to play him every day. And that, that's the only way that I would see them do it because there's just no room for him right now on on the field and I feel like if they do want to play him every day there has to be an opening for that you know because uh when it comes to like development and stuff like that I would love to see him get every day at bats but it's like who are you gonna like who are they gonna take out you know so it would be fun if he gets to call up in September like we said at the beginning of the year we said it there was a chance that maybe it could happen maybe a cup of coffee type thing Come up, play a little defense, steal a few bases. Get a taste of the bigs. Yeah, maybe get some pinch hit at, at bats or something like that. Get a that. taste of the fee- playoff fever. Yeah, but there, I, I just, I'm not, I don't feel like any significant thing for him is going to happen this year. They're, they have a lot of roster decisions to make in the offseason, but that's kind of the thing. And Mervis, that's a whole other thing. Like, he, because they s- traded for Candelario, I don't know yeah, where don't he's going to play. And you got to play Morell every day. He's like the second leading home, uh, second leading hitter and and home runs on your team. You have to play him every day, so you can't throw necessarily throw him in the DH role. Um, and and again, you'd rather play Bellinger or Candelario at first base. Mm-hmm. So it's like I don't see a spot for him at least the rest of this year, unless there's an injury. Yeah, well, look at the PCA one specifically. Which I mean, I yeah, Mervis. I injuries is probably the most likely situation that you see Mervis back on the big league team this year um, just because he had struggled for I mean, he hit the ball hard I know that um, but just the results weren't quite there he was 
Um, there are different things that played factors and and why he went back down and hasn't come back up yet. But like you said, with with Jamer Candelario now in the lineup and and with the ability to play first base, it's going to be hard to see Mervis come back up. Um, but for PCA, like I'm looking at it and the AAA lineup doesn't or AAA roster. What am I trying to say AAA schedule doesn't end till the September 24th. So I don't see any. I don't see a, a, a likely scenario that he's he doesn't just finish that triple A season yeah. with Iowa. If for some reason, like that last week, they decided to give him a cup of coffee. I mean, it, that still feels unlikely too. Um, but even then, like if we're talking about the Cubs being in the postseason, I think like there's like specific eligibility rules that like they have to be maybe on the 40 man or something like that by the end of August. So like, I, I don't think if they were to add him at the end, at the end of September, like select his contract, add him to the 40 man, I don't believe, unless there's, like, I think they would have to petition Manfred, the commissioner. I don't think in that scenario he would even be able to play in the playoffs with the Cubs. So it just feels like a very unlikely scenario to see that we see PCA at all this year. I know they're going to really, really want to just give him as many at-bats, everyday playing time mm -hmm. as they can this year, especially if there are real plans of him being up early next year, maybe even opening day. They're going to want him to just keep playing every single day, doing his and thing. The, and, and they'll then, probably send him to Arizona Fall League, too, I would expect. I, 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 I don't know, just because that's – I think because he's played the whole season. I, I, don't, I, don't expe I wouldn't expect them to send him I'd, to I'd rather Fall see him get a couple games with the Cubs than the Arizona Fall League, if that's for uh, sure. Like, I, I agree I'm with you on that. I'm not necessarily yeah, saying yeah. that, but I'm – Right. I just feel like they're going to want him to get as many at-bats as possible Yeah. because I think that they do want him to be on the opening day roster. You get a – you get like you get a draft pick now if you promote if you promote a guy on the opening day roster. Like I don't know, that's something to talk about down the road. It is fun to think about the possibility. I would be so much more on the train for it if the Cubs had issues in the outfield. Like they're kind of overloaded in the outfield yeah. right now. You know, like I know everyone's complaining about where Hap's hitting the lineup, but it's not like he's been a negative WAR player for them. Right. Bellinger's giving you gold glove defense in center field with Talkman being very good out there. I know Say has been the doghouse, but he played well over the weekend, and he had that great game against the Mets. So you're hoping that he's starting to climb out of it. Like, in either way, he's on a five-year contract. I, I don't see the Cubs taking playing time from him unless, until unless there's just unless he really dives down again and, and goes down through a bad stretch. Maybe then, but I don't know. Yeah. It's it's again, it's fun to think about. Yeah. Sean in the yep. uh, live chats uh, reminding that the player has to be on the 40-man roster or 60 days are injured list by the 31st of August. So that's, that's what I said, yeah. That's why the days are a little bit tricky. Um, that's why that's I said. Is, is, is like, he not on the 40-man? No, he's not on the 40-man. No, okay. Not yet. And, and, not yet. He will be eventually. <laughs> um, Next year for sure. Yeah, yeah. Real quick before we go, I do want to mention, you know, we got the takeover coming up on Wednesday. Did we mention that? Have we mentioned it? <laughs> Guys, tickets may have are still available. Past. Let's not get outnumbered by Sox fans at our, at our own takeover. The Sox one Are you diehard out. out there? Are you on the chat? I see I see a lot of names. We see all the time. I hope to see, uh, you know, I hope the Is godfather Mike Michael Collada can make it. I would like to see the godfather out of takeover. The godmother. I would like to see the godmother, Barb. If Barb could yeah. make it out. Is Mike Dubs going to be there? Mike Dubs will be there. Mike that. Dubs is going to be there. Uh, Niren maybe Niren gonna show up. Niren was out there opening day. I'd like oh, yeah. to see Niren out there. Craig, we've got a lot of people. Yeah, we still a lot have of people in the available. chat. A lot of regulars. I'd like to see some of you guys out there. And like I, I said this last week, where the pregame is at almost home, which is diagonally across the street from Obvious Shirts. So you can literally go to Sunnyside after you see Ian Hat batting third in the lineup. Go to Sunnyside to make yourself feel better. Then walk down to Obvious Short, Obvious Shirts store, pick up. The summer of Mike Talkman shirt. That's right. And then walk across the Collab. street to us, to all, all, where we're at. We'll be at almost home, where you'll then get your shirt that you get for coming to our event, and then hang out with us and have a few drinks, and then walk with us to the park. Mark is asking uh, in the chat tickets? Question mark. Yep, yeah, Mark. That's we're I, maybe we're not clear about this, and I, well, let's make it real clear. Yes, we're hanging out at almost home tavern and grill before the game, but then. CHGO is buying a, a block of tickets at the game. So if you go to allchgo.com right now, first of all, if you're a diehard, it's 20% off everything. Yep. So that's great. And you get a shirt. But 
We're all going to go. We're all going to have our shirts. We're all going to go as a group to the Cubs game. So, it, yes, you're buying a ticket to the Cub game with CHGO. So we've got a block of tickets. You're buying the tickets from us. They're cheaper than if you were just going to go out and try and buy the ticket yourself. So we're going to go as a group yes. and take over a section at the Cubs game as the CHGO group all hanging out as one. So, yes, we're talking about all going to the Cubs game together. Yeah. That's, that's the gist of it, right? Maybe even have a beer after the game, too. Maybe even have a beer after the game. I basically live, well, I live like a mile north. Two we're going to have a good north. time. There might be some giveaways. Yeah, giveaways. Don't forget. Oh, and again, golf vibes, still. vibes will be good. We're playing the Sox. You know, hopefully that day they're going for the sweep to sweep the season series in general. Would, listen, be, would be fun. And, listen, and I'll be there. Almost home, we'll have some Goose Islands, too. So we're going to have some drink tickets for everybody that comes as well. Goose Island, the official beer of CHGO, Chicago's beer since 1988. Uh, Tropical Beer Hug, Goose IPA 312, the Full Pocket Pilsner. Try any of them at that takeover. Almost Home Tavern and Grill, 3801 North Clark Grab Ultra Fresh. Brewery exclusive beers at Goose Island's original brew house also at Clybourne Avenue in Lincoln Park. From their tap room on Fulton Street in West Town, Goose Island Beer Company, Chicago's Beer. And we got the... Uh, the golf outing at Cog Hill coming up, too. Yeah. And you can buy those tickets, I believe, until Friday. Tickets, uh, just a couple of spots left in our inaugural CHGO kickoff classic coming up. Not this Friday. Next Friday, the 25th, a shotgun start out at Cog Hill. Pins and Aces. You'll get a, a towel from Pins and Aces in CHGO. Uh, We'll all hang out, golf, we'll have giveaways d- during the thing, we'll have prizes, we'll have lunch together afterwards, we'll have a good time. So, But to me, right now, the big thing is, let's not get outnumbered by Sox fans. Yeah. Sox also sold out their takeover. They did. That's why I said that we have tickets available, because the Sox Come on sold now. out there. Come on now. And we still have tickets available with two days before the event. Like, don't make me have to, like, call my mom and beg her. Like, come on now. <laughs> to make the drive up from yeah. Central Illinois. Yeah, to make my mom drive up from God's country up to here. Like, don't make, don't make me have to do it. You All should right. want to be a part of this Wrigley experience, mm-hmm. too, down the stretch, man. It has been so much fun at the ballpark the last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Like, come on. I was at the last Let's home go. game at Wrigley when they, when they uh, won the series against the Braves. That was the best game by far that I've been to this year with the, the energy that was in that park that day, the way that game went, despite the fact that it rained. Oh, it was. I know it's the White Sox and they're not having a great year, but that makes I know it I, I, from my experience of being on this, going to the game on the South Side this year, like and watching that seven to two comeback that we saw that day. It's going to be electric at Wrigley on Wednesday. Eighty one in the afternoon for a high temperature, down to like fifty eight in the evening for a low. Perfect summer night. Cubs, Sox, Strowman's return. Hopefully not humid like it was at the Sox game. And, you know, Dan Plezak, by the way, hit the like button <laughs> for Dan so Plezak. For sure. <laughs> Dan said, like, out of those 12 games, the next 12 before they face the Brewers, yeah. he's saying, like, eight, eight, nine. I want to see 10 out of 12. And I'd like to see, like Niren was saying in the chat, give me five, six, seven in a row here. You're playing some dog teams. Yeah. Eat them up. Spit them the out. Sox There's a schedule right on the, the Brewers. They just, the Sox just got swept by the Brewers. They're coming into Wrigley, you know they'll 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 be up for the series because you know how the how they are against the Cubs. But you know the Cubs have already won the first two. They they need to to me they need to win these next two, uh, because it it just it's hard for me to say they need to win them all or to not say they oh. need to win them all because those are <laughs> bad teams. But especially the Sox the first are not two. good, man. They just the, aren't. None Cody, of the these Sox teams and aren't. Royals yeah. are the Sox and Royals. The, our next five games for the Cubs are a combined sixty-eight games under five hundred. Yeah. Yes, you need to win all five of those. Yes. Yeah. Any <laughs> any loss <laughs> in those five games would be disappointing. It would be annoying. Yeah. Because those are bottom dwellers yeah. right there. Yeah. And the team's playing well right now. The only, if I if the only reason I'm complaining about the team right now is because of David Ross and how he's making the lineup, that's telling. Because then I could I'm not complaining about this guy not playing good or this guy not playing good. It's just, you know, I'm 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 bitching about marginal things. You're finding ways to complain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm admitting that. Big of me, credit to me, all right? The team's playing well. But yeah, I could be a lot better if we weren't batting Ian Happ third and 
you know, maybe play Mike Talkman against some lefties, man. Just go. Just go. Let's, Cubs is going to win these next few games so Cody could be happy. That's right. Let's keep the vibe. I want to play in October. <laughs> that's I'm, right, Edward. <laughs> you give me October, I'll stop complaining the rest of the year. Everything else, you could play in October for this season, you get in October, everything else after that is house money. That's all it is. <laughs> Edward agrees with me. Hashtag vibes. Hashtag vibe with us. Uh, we are back for Crosstown tomorrow. We'll have the post game show right here on C. Do we have pre game tomorrow? I think we have pre tomorrow. Pre and post CHGO yeah. right here. Uh, make sure you join us. Please hit the like button on the way out. If you're downloading this in podcast form, please give us a like, hello, and check out the live YouTube feed whenever you get the chance. It's the most fun way to get involved in the chat and hang out with us as we become uh, the coolest place ever to watch Cubs baseball, which we've already done. So that's that. Thanks for checking out the CHGO Cubs podcast. Big thanks to our guest, Dan Plezak from MLB Network. For Cody and Ryan, I'm Luke. Uh, and don't forget Kevin on the ones and twos over there uh, producing. We'll see you tomorrow. Cubs Sox, fly the W. Until then, have a great day.